Okay, hi everyone. As well, as the man said, I'm not the guy to pick the colors for your next step. So, most of you know someone who, someone who doesn't know how to set up his own mic. Is it okay now? Yay! Okay, so a lot of you know someone who doesn't really like the cloud, and that's mostly because they've met solutions that were so well integrated. They've met solutions which were so secure, so simple, and they worked with real life experts. So what we do differently is we whisper to the clouds and the clouds tend to listen us. So hi everyone, my name is Ivan and he pronounced it correctly, the surname is Chuljak. So my official role is the cloud solution architect, but since I own the company, I've changed it to Cloud Whisperer. So what we usually do is we get wrecks from other teams, we salvage them, we ship them further. So every now and then there, there's a greenfield project, so we're like, oh my God, oh my God, we're gonna make it good from the start. And we don't have a website yet, because although the designer designed it years ago, and he was like, Ivan, you need to figure out two sentences, just two of them. And I'm still thinking, but we'll solve it eventually. So the story begins with, there was a desktop app. Me being a .NET engineer, we were used to building amazing stuff with uh, .NET. And since .NET allows you to build whatever you want to, basically, at least the framework, we've been built so much lousy stuff because we've done some horrors. So there was a desktop app used by a guy to crawl the websites and then do some cool things, some actions based on the data that was collected. And the whole thing started with a night out, he explaining what he's doing, and we were like, hold our beer. Because what was the, the problem? He was building a team, and everyone needed to install the app on their own machine. Some people had problems with drivers, some had problems with internet, etc., etc. Some had Windows Vista, not the best thing to have. So we wanted to refactor the whole thing. And the first thing to do was, let's move it to a VM. Why? Because you can install the, the app on a VM, have it run there reliably, and then you can RDP to the thing. When you RDP to the thing, it doesn't matter whether your machine runs or not. If it fails, the process will continue working, but that wasn't good enough. The problem, one of the problem, uh, problems was that the VMs were in the same data center and they all had IP addresses from the same IP address range. So the sites could easily figure out who's crawling them. The next thing we did is we've added a proxy, but we've added a proxy to the virtual machine meaning that someone had to tweak them if needed, and it worked, so do it yourself, crawling the, the World Wide Web. And then we've added so much more proxies, so much more clients, so much more VMs, so much more sysops time. And that was a huge problem, because each time there was a new client or a new worker, we needed to set up the whole thing. And to be completely honest, it was okay. So what we were charging them was acceptable to, to the client and everyone was happy, but we were bored and we wanted to build something that's cooler. So say hello to adding a whole bunch of queues, functions, containers, infrastructure as code, multiple clouds, Kubernetes, even small Raspberry Pi clusters in dorm rooms. So why in dorm rooms? Because there's a public static IP address. All the stud students are going to the internet through it and you can mimic being a student. So you just pay someone 20, 30 euros a month and have them host it in their dorm room. So figure it out. At the end of the day, <laughs> it worked out fine, but the process was hmm, interesting. So first things first, in order to move to the cloud, 
in a proper manner. So just spinning up a VM on the cloud is only going to increase your bill. It's not a migration to the cloud. So first thing we had to do was split the desktop application, rebuild the UI from a desktop app to a web app, and then host the engine somewhere. In order for them to communicate, we needed to add a queue between them. And that worked fine, but th the thing is, we didn't gain much by doing that. There was a web app UI, and we still had the virtual machine to host the service. So, yeah, okay, small steps. <sighs> then, right ab around that time, Azure, so, yeah, I I'm an Azure guy. So, a Azure started publishing functions, their serverless offering. And we wanted to play around. So the idea was, hey, we have an engine running on a VM, which is lousy, that's so 90s. Let's rewrite it into functions and host it on Azure. It's gonna be so, 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 so cool. So during that period, we found out a whole bunch of things. For example, a function can run for 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, it's timed out. It's gonna break and they don't care that you were doing something, so that's a problem. When you're calling a function from another function, that calling function can time out while the, the called function is doing something, so that's a bad practice. You need to add queues between them. Next problem was, okay, we've added queues, but we don't control the scaling, and we don't control on which instance the function will gather the, the message from the queue which meant that we were doing part of the requests from one IP address and the other part from the other IP address, which you can guess is bringing up a red flag on the site you're crawling. And th there's a huge problem no one is discussing about. What happens when your function breaks? Because yeah, sure, you can see it later in the log analytics, but what happens how can your code react to a function failing since you don't have a reference to it? So all of those problems are solvable. Now, they weren't in 2017, at least not easy. So we've spent a whole, whole lot of time and made a small step for the project and wasted a huge amount of time, which is okay. Yeah, you live, you learn. So. The idea, the second idea was, if you can't rewrite it, let's just wrap it up in a container and ship it, which is what most big companies are doing nowadays. It's like, we're gonna migrate to the cloud, not to VMs, we're just gonna wrap up everything and move it to the cloud. That's how GCP Cloud Run started existing. Okay, so when we've wrapped up everything into a container, pushed it to the cloud, we've ended up basically with the same thing we had. There was a web app, there was something using your infrastructure at the whole time. If it fails, tough luck, figure it out. So, it was fancy, it was more modern, it was still lousy. So to back up a bit, let's go for the evolution of app hosting. So first, there was a server in a town, a shared server provided to you by your local hosting company. And everyone was sharing it and putting up their web apps up there until someone wrote a bad script and crashed the whole server. So after that, everyone figured out, hey, I want to have a server of my own. When that server wasn't enough, they grew to a farm of servers. And then someone figured out, hey, we have a whole bunch of servers, but the CPU usage is at 5%. How can we make it more profitable for, for us. So VMs came, and there are other reasons for, for VMs, but. So VMs were installed on the server. You could use your server much more densely with them, and it all started working okay until one of those servers failed. So then someone figured out, hey, we could have a cluster of VMs over a farm of servers, so if one fails, we can spin up the, the VM snapshot on another. Cool. Then, again, someone figured out, hey, but those VMs aren't using this hardware as they could. So we've started using containers, not the Docker containers. There were other containers before Docker. But SysOps guys probably went nuts with maintaining all of that. So someone decided, hey, let's build an orchestrator. 
the most known today is Kubernetes. And you can guess that we've just discussed a whole bunch of technologies, a whole bunch of technologies that can't be handled by a single person. You need a team of SysOps people. And we are developers. We don't want to be maintaining infrastructure 24-7. And some projects can't really afford having a full-time SysOps guy, let alone a team running 24-7. So what we want to do is we want to develop the code. We want to push it out there. And then some black magic or Azure magic will happen. It will run. It will scale. It will resurrect. That's where serverless comes into the play. So let's start with what serverless isn't. Serverless isn't the, an execution model. So functions are an execution model. That's not only that's not serverless. They do overlap. Then some people say serverless is having a managed service. Not really. That's a managed service. Then it's an operational construct. It's not. It's not even a spectrum. So s you know how we tend to over-engineer things. So in order to define what serverless is, someone decided to create a spectrum where you could measure how serverless is something. Yeah. So And it's not a technology. So what serverless is, it's a really bad name because Everyone just says to you, but there are servers. Yeah, I know. So serverless is a methodology how you do stuff. Serverless is a journey, not necessarily a destination. So by going serverless, you start focusing on what matters to you and start outsourcing what doesn't. So implementing your own uh, a third party of provider can be a step in the right serverless direction because you do other stuff. You don't handle users. Not handling infrastructure, same thing, and so on and so on. For example, you don't want to uh, take care of your own email servers. You'll just use SendGrid or, or, or something. So that serverless journey will take you through hmm, a rough time, depending on where are you working. First of all, you're going to have to rethink your whole architecture. That might be an issue, depending on whether you own the company, whether you're a small business, whether you're an enterprise and you need to convince 100 people. Your planning will be challenged, and the biggest issue in big co uh, corporations is budgeting, because someone will come to you and ask, how much will that cost? And you will ask, how many users do you plan to have? And they will be like, I have no idea. And you'll be like, neither do I. So the problem, <laughs> yeah, the problem is it's tough to, to reimagine the process. It, it, it requires you to shift your mind. And your developers will need to start working dif differently. So the current state of serverless is everyone probably knows what a car is. Let's guess everyone knows. Most of the cars in Croatia have a manual gearbox. There's also an automatic gearbox. But if you take a look at electric cars, they've reimagined the whole problem. Most of them don't have a gearbox. So I'm saying most of them because the electric Mustang does have a manual gearbox. Have no idea why. So by having no gearbox, they've solved a problem of shifting gears. So VMs are the manual shift gear, the manual gearbox. Serverless is a really good automatic gearbox. And it allows you to just use it in most situations, but it doesn't allow you to just use it in some situations. So you have to take care of some scaling controllers by yourself to scale it out, to deploy multiple applications, to think about what might happen and to handle manually edge cases. So back to the drawing board, to our crawler. So we've listed out some issues. Why issues? Because the system was working and we were just playing around. So the first issue was we were paying for the infrastructure 24-7, even though no one was using it all the time. We were depending on proxies. Some of those proxies were really, really slow. Why? Because they were free. And we had performance bottlenecks on our infrastructure because we were spinning up a VM or a container per user. 
So if a user uh, sent a whole bunch of requests, a problem occurred. And the biggest issue was when a new user would register, we weren't able to automatically scale and speed up infrastructure for that person. So the, the problems were interconnected and we needed to solve one uh, to solve the other. And then we were starting to think which one should be solved per first. And the first one to be solved was scaling automatically, which meant we needed to start using infrastructure as code, but not any infrastructure as code. We needed something powerful, which we can trigger from our code. So when someone on the sign up process clicks finish, we would spin up an instance running our infrastructure as code and spinning up additional stuff. So what we would spin up is a database per user, a web application for that user, a queue, a container. So how do we do that? We've used Pulumi, and Pulumi is an amazing tool. So what we're mixing there is, for you can write it using real code, not some markup language. We are using C-sharp. Before last year, we were using TypeScript. So what Pulumi allows you is to write a piece of code which defines your infrastructure, but before that piece of code, you can do whatever. So that whatever for us was connecting to a database, fetching the list of everything we should have up and running, giving that list through variables to, to the Pulumi code, and then magic would happen. And we would have a whole bunch of containers spun, spin up or down. So that solved the automatic scalability problem. The next issue to solve was paying for the infrastructure 24-7. The idea there was, since we have infrastructure as code and we can spin up a container in less than 30 seconds, there's really no need to have it up and running at all times. We could just spin it up if it's not available when a user requests some crawling, because crawling websites isn't really time sensitive. Whether you start 10 seconds earlier or, or later, no one cares. So what we did is we would spin up a container if needed and automatically schedule a message in a queue to shut down that container. And then there was a function which would listen to that queue when it was scheduled to, to shut down the machine. It would check whether there are any active requests going on. If no, it would shut down the container. If yeah, it would leave it alone and reschedule a message. That's why you don't want to use simple queues. You just use enterprise service bus because you can schedule a message at some point in time and you can do it easily using uh, an API. Okay, so that solved the, the infrastructure problem. The next thing we wanted to solve was the bottleneck. So we had only one instance running per user. If a user was too eager to, to crawl the whole web, we would have performance issues. So we've started checking whether we have enough controllers for the amount, uh, enough containers for the amount of active requests we have. If yeah, just send a request. If no, we would first spin up additional uh, containers. And all of that can be done through a few lines of code using Pulumi. I don't work for Pulumi, I just adore them. So that solved that issue. The last issue that remains is proxies. And we were dependent on proxies to fake from where are we crawling the website. So it was like, yay, only that. And that was the toughest, the toughest issue because our code was designed to figure out from where it should seem the request is coming and then to connect to a certain proxy, route the data through it, et cetera, et cetera. So at the end of the day, we've deleted a whole lot of code and make, made the crawler simpler. Why? Because when you have infrastructure as code and you have accounts or on all the clouds, you don't have to fake that you are in New York City. You can just spin up a container in a data center in New York, New York City. If you want to crawl from Brazil, just spin up a container there. So by using infrastructure as code, we were able to spin up containers all across the globe in any data center, in any, almost any cloud provider, and in 
on local Kubernetes clusters, some of which were in dorm rooms and still are. They're so, so pretty. You get four Raspberry Pis stuck one up <laughs> above the other. So first, we had the engine figure out through which proxy to route the data. And now we have a whole bunch of containers. So how do we solve which containers should get the request? We just use, since we've started using the enterprise service bus, you can just use topics there and reroute the data because you can write SQL I in your service bus, which will reroute the data to any given uh, queue. And this allowed us to mimic surfing a site from the same IP address for a long time. So one of the issues with functions was that we could do something for 10 minutes, but over here when you spin up a container, you can mimic surfing a site for three days. So you can go to, let's say, Amazon, go check some shoes, then stay there for a few seconds, then come back t tomorrow, and then the day after tomorrow, all from the same IP address, and mimic being a real customer. And some sites will eventually, on the third or fourth or fifth visit, just give you a discount. And then you do some action, like, for example, you buy those shoes. So we wanted to do it in many different ways, but we wanted uh, a simple and stupid solution. So we've ended up with this. There's a piece of code. I'm not good with naming, so the, the, the most important piece of code was called yay. So the most important piece of code was called conductor because it conducts the, the orchestra. And <laughs> so the idea is the conductor checks whether there's a container. If it's not, it generates a GUID, spins up the container, gives the GUID as an environmental variable. So all as simple as possible. When the, the container is up and running, the container sends a message down the queue back to the conductor saying, I'm ready. And then the conductor starts sending requests down a certain queue or topic. And we've solved all the issues. And that's it. It's as simple as that. It, it's a system spinning up and down automatically infrastructure across the globe on a multi-cloud solution and this is how you do it. And basically, you, you should work, we should all strive on building simple solutions because everyone can build a complex solution. But building something like this, <laughs> I can see him tapping his friend. <laughs> so by building a simple solution, you, you will have some peace of mind and you will be able to advance it in the near future easily. So this allows us to run on all the major clouds, we're not using Oracle, on DigitalOcean, on Linode, on Kubernetes, on whatever. And there's plenty left to say, but let's, this is my third time on, on Shift, so let's end with a teaser for the next season. So the next step you do is you start thinking about events. We've only discussed using queues, and the queue is a message in a queue is a command. So if you're a new eager parent, you're like, the dinner is ready, go eat your dinner now. And you're waiting for the kids to, to, to go eat their dinner. An event is what happens when you're a parent of a five-year-old or, or even older. You just give up and it's like the dinner is ready. Do with that information whatever you want to. I don't really care. So th those are events. And not every message in a queue can be changed for a event, but most of them can. And that will allow you to build your system in a more extendable way because with queues, with messages, the piece of code that sends a message should be aware of the next business step. So even though the next step isn't in that code base, you need all pieces of your code need to be aware of your business logic. With events, you just say it's done. And whoever listens to it can 
continue with some other business logic, but your code will be so much more simpler. And you'll end up in so much more problems, like security. Everyone knows about SQL injection. Yeah, so we've established that in 2020, we should sanitize our text inputs. Cool. Here's a stupid, uh, a, a, a really stupid attack. We allow a user to upload a file to a cloud storage. The file name contains SQL injection. An event goes and says, hey, there's a new file and this is the name. Y you save it to a SQL database. Good luck. Or you react to that event, you process a file, and then you add that file name into your database catalog saying, hey, we also have this file. So with, with new cloud solutions, you need to start Huh. <laughs> you need to start searching for all the creative ways someone can attack you and hurt you. And by doing that mind shift, you might be actually good at it because when you start thinking about how can I protect from something, that's a chore, that, that's boring. But when you start thinking about how can I break into something, that's creative. And then challenge yourself and try breaking into your own system. Better you than a malicious guy. That's it. Thank you so much. And enjoy your food. <laughs>